Hey, Johns, it is a joy to see each and every one of you here with us this morning. If you are worshiping with us virtually, we'd like to ask that you register your attendance in the comments section of the live stream. If you are visiting with us this morning, we invite you to fill out the Connect card in your bulletin. Members and visitors alike are invited to share that with just the staff and the pastors or with your, um, the rest of your church family. You may hand the completed cards to a staff person or an usher, or you may leave them in the offering plate located at the front of the sanctuary on your way out this morning. It's not too late to pick up your copy of The Walk, the book that we are using for our sermon series over the next several weeks. Copies of The Walk are available in the lobby, or you may also order them from Amazon if you prefer a Kindle or a large print edition. This is an easy read and a good book, so that we, we hope that you will join us. Don't stay home if you forgot to read or you fall behind. Um, you will be fine. We want you to still come to church even if you have not read the chapter for the week. This morning we're covering chapter one. Next week we will cover chapter two. We're also having chat back sessions at 1015 right across the hall in room number 211. We would love for you to join us there. It's an opportunity to talk about the book and how it impacts our lives as well as our lives together as a congregation. The hospitality team is meeting tomorrow, April the 19th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. If you are part of that committee, a link will be sent out um, via email. The finance committee will not be meeting on Tuesday. And we have good news for you this morning and that sign up for worship is no longer required. Um, you guys have been really great about signing up every week and letting us know when you're coming. We did that so that we could manage the numbers during COVID and make sure that we were staying within the recommended guidelines. We've been able to do that, um, and so we're not going to ask that you continue to sign up. If something changes with COVID or if something changes um, with the, the management of, of our um, numbers in worship, then we may revisit that. But for right now, you no longer need to worry about signing up in order to come to church on Sunday morning. Let us continue our worship together as Mary Watson brings us this morning's diaconia. Good morning. This past year has been such a difficult time for everyone, and especially our church. During the COVID pandemic and the isolation of quarantine, it's created so much stress on each of us individually and corporately as a church community. Now we are able to come together again, and I want us to think about what we, as the family of St. John's, must do to recreate community in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. This past Wednesday night, the Chancel Choir had our first practice in over a year. I cannot tell you how good it felt to reunite with friends and just to try to sing again, even though we were wearing, all of us wearing our masks and socially distanced. Many people have told me how they have missed being able to worship in person. There is something so special about worshiping together as a church family. We are stronger when we are in community working and worshiping in our church. We are able to accomplish so much more together than we can alone. The difficulties of this past year have caused us to see how important it is to serve Christ as a community and be part of this family of God. As we are able to expand our worship experiences, I encourage you to participate in these chat series based on the book, The Walk. And as Coleman Nyes eloquently noted last week, the Missions Committee has numerous opportunities for us to work together and reach out to not only the St. John's community, but to the community, the larger community in need. Author J.K. Rowling has said, we are only as strong as we are united. 
as weak as we are divided. Unity is strength. Where there is collaboration and teamwork, wonderful things can be achieved. Some of you may know that I'm a retired kindergarten teacher. And over the years, I love to share with my students, parents, an essay that was written about 30 years ago by Robert Fulgham, a Unitarian minister. It was called, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And I'd like to share just a part of that with you today. Fulgham said, All I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school, and these are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. And warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. So everything we need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule, love, and basic sanitation. And it is still true no matter how old you are. When you go out into the world, it is best to hold hands and stick together. Now, let us continue in our worship. Please rise in body or in spirit for this morning's call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come in the divine presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. 
It is good to give thanks, O ye, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O God, have made us glad by your work. At the works of your hands we sing for joy. You may be seated for the opening hymn. Please rise in body or in spirit for the affirmation of faith for Eastertide, printed in your bulletin. This is the gospel which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins, raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women then to Peter and the Twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Gloria Patri, printed in your bulletin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. 
Amen. The peace of the Lord be with, always with you. All may exchange signs and words of God's peace with many by gently using the words, peace be with you, and offering a wave, open palms, or palms over your heart. Amen. It's good to begin to... To build that community back. So, at this time, if there are any children uh, that would like to come forward, I invite you for our children's moment with our director of children's ministries, Emily Bell. of when you hear the word worship? God, good answer. Yep. Jesus. What about where you worship? At church. And what about when? Every single day. And on Sundays here together, Together. So an important part of worship is being together. All of us working together, listening to worship songs, saying our affirmations of faith, and just being in community with each other to feel that love together, right? And then what do you think of when you hear the word prayer? When you're praying for something, mm -hmm. when you're praying for someone, God, good answer. So how, how do you pray? How do you start? Do you have to have like a, a special way, anything special? You say hello. Good answer. And you just say hello? <laughs> you can bow your head. Yep. Dear God, absolutely. You just start talking, right? Yeah, exactly. You just start. You can say, thank you. You can say, you're, yep, you can say those things. <laughs> well, do y'all want to pray together and we can hear more about how worship and prayer are important? Okay. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together. For worship and giving us time to pray. Amen. All right, good job. We come to the portion of our worship service where we lift up the joys and our, our joys and concern, those things that we celebrate that God has answered, that He showed up in our lives or the lives of other people. Uh, but we also bring forth those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. Uh, this morning we want to remember Cheryl Hughes, who will be having back surgery tomorrow. We want to continue to remember uh, Be uh, Beverly Moon and uh, Lila Jane Long as they're continuing cancer treatment. And uh, we also want to remember uh, the tragic events uh, from a little over a week ago. Uh, we want to remember the Adams family and the Leslie family. as They still mourn those losses uh, and then in the wake, uh, in the, not wake, but in the recent days, just in Indianapolis, we heard of the tragic events there. And uh, I believe Pastor Dave is going to reference it in his sermon, but in the last 30 days, there's been 45 similar incidents. I want to lift up all these situations to God and uh, just pray for his mercy and his grace on us. So I invite you to pray with me this morning. God of dawn and darkness. Lord, we're grateful for your loving mercy. 
You've seen our fear and our doubt, our suspicion, our mistrust. And you've banished them from our lives and you've replaced them with hope, peace, love, and joy. And you've called us to be your witnesses to all the world, unafraid of what others are going to think of us or say about us. God, we've been invited out of our darkened hideaways and into the light of your world as emissaries of hope, justice, peace, and compassion. God, be with us as we participate in ministries of healing and of hope through this church, your church, St. John's, in our community, in our region, in our nation, in our world. God, give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all the circumstances of our lives. God, and for those of us who are are hurting, who are trying to wrap our our heads around uh, recent events, no matter what they are, God, I just pray that your presence would be real. That you would make your presence alive to us. God, that we wouldn't try to lean into our own understanding, God, but we would lean into you. And that we would look to the Gospels, look to your word. And we would see the life that your son lived, which was a life of leaning into you. We would use that as an example. God, as we come to you in prayer this morning, that we would also use his example of prayer as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now come to our uh, portion where we give back what God has given to us. Uh, We're talking about worship today uh, in our kickoff of this series. And Giving, tithing is a response to what God has done in our life. So I invite you to do that this morning. There's a couple ways that you can. You can give electronically through our St. John's UMC Rock Hill app, or you can text St. John's RH Give to 77977. This is especially for our folks who are worshiping, worshiping with us online. And as always, as you exit the sanctuary in the annex, there's an offering plate available for you. So the Lord be with you as you consider your giving. Thank you. 
Amen. Will you pray with me as we pray over our offering this morning? Mighty God who brings life and hope, offer to the disciples, touch me and see me. Make us bold to grab hold of the risen Christ, not for this day, but for every day. May we offer our gifts this morning, not to the church historical, but the church that was, but to a church that is becoming, that is still being born, that Christ is going to bring into the future. May our eyes and our ears and hearts continue to hold on to him as we help Christ lead his church forward. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you. It's wonderful to see a few more folk here in the sanctuary uh, and to greet you today in Christ's name. As we begin our sermon and study series on the walk, our first lesson today comes from the 95th Psalm, uh, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If I ask you, what makes the church unique? What characteristic or activity or event makes the church special, unlike any other group or institution that you might be part of? Now, those of us who like to eat might say maybe covered dish suppers, uh, could be Bible studies, could be sitting in pews. Where else do you sit in pews? Uh, or maybe asking for money. But some of those may be true, but the most unique activity that we do in the church, the most particular practices, are worship and prayer. The first two verses of Psalm 95, this first lesson of our series of the walk, can be termed a call, a gathering to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Worship is also a live event of interaction between you and God and me and God. In worship twice already at the third church and fighting pollen such as you and I have this week, my voice cracked pretty severely. I, I was getting extremely hoarse. Now, I was completely certain that one of our church members was going to fall out of her pew and roll on the floor under the pew in front of her in total laughter as I announced, Let us, let us, let us worship God. That was what it really sounded like. 
And you know, it's pretty sad when that's barely how you're able to say it, but uh, you can understand Henrietta's reaction. Worship is live. It is a living, hope-filled encounter between you and your Savior. It is a unique act of our faith. And it is the first of Adam Hamilton's five walk habits that we are going to look at, which are routines for better, more faithful Christian living. As we said during this study, Adam Hamilton, the pastor, founding pastor, as I was, of a church in Pauley's Island, uh, but he is at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. And he's going to highlight these five essential uh, characteristics, traits, habits of Christian living, of walking behind our Savior. They are studying, which we will look at next week. Giving, yes, we're going to talk about that one, sorry. Uh, sharing, and first this morning, worship and prayer. We'll explore one spiritual discipline for each Sunday for the next five weeks. Now the idea of walking, this imagery of your and my faith, as a walk is found in Scripture both in the Old and the New Testaments. The spiritual life is to be one of walking with Jesus each and every day. And we hear in the old gospel hymn of Jesus talking with me and walking with me. These spiritual practices will help to keep our faith fresh, healthy, and growing, and to abide and continue to abide in a deep love with our Savior requires focusing upon these critical exercises, much like you do with your physical and mental health. As I mentioned, establishing a church, Don and I were assigned by the bishop to start a new congregation at Pauley's Island in Litchfield Beach a number of years ago. We used volunteers in our office. One of our office volunteers, when the phone was kind of quiet, I noticed would be doing the crossword puzzle almost every time. I think she came on Wednesdays. And I asked her, I said, Val, why do you do the crossword puzzle? She said, I'm retired and it keeps my mind sharp. Similarly, these habits are in sharp and alive. And if we're going back to the basics in this sermon and in this series, maybe it's helpful to ask, what is exactly this thing that we do week in and week out called worship. How would you define it? Adam Hamilton gives a variety of different ones. We could ask, is it fish or foul or funny? Uh, and you know, now we don't really think about it, but to people outside of the church and people who haven't been in the church, what we do is a little odd, maybe, uh, out of the ordinary, not understood. I mean, some of them even may think that I tame snakes or you are led to talk or shout in strange ways or that Ryan preaches all his sermons in Greek and Hebrew. We know none of that's true, and I'm just being silly. But what exactly is worship? 
The wonderful Catholic writer Evelyn Underhill stated, Worship in all its grades to the eternal. How we respond to God as his created persons. It's what you and I do to answer, to respond to Jesus' amazing love and his amazing grace. And, and his presence all around us, uh, where we see God in creation and the concern our children have for us. As an older parent now, sometimes I appreciate their concern and sometimes I don't. You may know what I mean, you know. My son in the height of, pan, of the pandemic said, Daddy, why do you really have to go to Target? Is there something you really need? Well, it was, it was out of concern. It was an expression of him showing God's love to me. It could be in the friendship of your best buddy or gal. It can be in your fellow church members, as Mary spoke of so eloquently earlier. Worship is first and foremost a praise to God. It is a humbling of us in adoration and amazement for what God has done for us. It is a hallelujah, an act of great excitement, great devotion, great enthusiasm to our great God. And as I said earlier, it is the most core action of faithful disciples. Many of you, I'm sure, have are aware or know or have seen his name, the great musical composer Johann Christian Bach. He stated that all music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. And then he added on a note, he said, Where this is not remembered, there is no real music, but a devilish hubbub. And all of his compositions were headed at the top with the initials JJ, which meant Jesus Juva, Jesus help me. And he ended them with SDG which means sola di grata, which means to God alone be the glory. He understood that composing that piece uh, required Jesus' help and that he would give all the recognition to God for what followed. And he did some amazing things and wrote some wonderful pieces. Bach reminds you and I of a second meaning of worship. After praise is refreshment is the word he uses. Remember the old Coke commercial that said something about the pause that refreshes? I think it was Coke. It may have been Pepsi. I don't know. You know. Some of you are very loyal to one or the other. So like Clemson, Carolina. I don't want to offend you, but anyway. He talked about worship as refreshment. That worship hurts our pains, our pressures, our loss to our Savior and to receive relief. Some of us may have watched the whole or clips of Queen Elizabeth and her family mourning the loss of her husband of 73 years. Last week and this week, our church family has lit candles in remembrance of those persons lost in the horrific shooting in our own community. And as Ryan said earlier, there have been over 45 incidents of gun violence where four or more persons have been lost 
in the last month alone. And study after study has shown that regular worship is beneficial to help you deal with life's bumps and bruises. Adam Hamilton reminds us that you and I do not attend worship at the same rate of our parents and grandparents. It's changed in the years I've been in ministry. We have more options for travel, for recreation, for vacation than ever before. At his church, Adam Hamilton encouraged his members to consider attending every Sunday except five or less Sundays. Online worship did count. I think that may not be that bad of an idea, you know, to set that as a goal. I mean, the benefits are who doesn't want to receive more guidance, more hope from your loving Jesus. Another unique aspect of our Christian faith that he highlights is prayer. Reverend Hamilton calls daily prayer our individual worship. He states that in our prayers we praise, we confess, we petition God for help, and we give thanks. I don't know about you, but I have to confess that I have far too high a percentage in my conversations of whining, complaining, and frustration. And I suspect that for a few of us, when you hear the word prayer coming into your mind, it kind of translates through the electronics of your brain to getting something. Many of us consider prayer to be that. I call them stoplight prayers, you know. You're at the stoplight, dear Jesus, please get me through this light. Get me around the corner, uh, you know. Help me find a parking place. I'm not saying that's not good. I'm just saying there's much more to prayer than petitions. A 2012 study involving 2,000 adults found that only 52% of women and 44% of men take time to express, instead of complaining, gratitude. Gratitude. Worship and prayer is appropriate to God, but it is also important for your personal, emotional, and spiritual well-being. In fact, there have been numerous reports that say living a life of emotions decreases your chance of depression, helps you sleep better, and increases the heart markers that are found when you have blood work done. Lord knows my, my uh, uh, cardiac doctor would be happy to know that. Paul in 1 Thessalonians asks you, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks to God in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now going back to the beginning of the sermon, I hinted at what is another purpose of worship. It is to connect us, to bring interconnectedness between you and God, between me and God. Uh, it is to hear and observe God's direction and guidance as you have not before. Adam Hamilton and I have found that it is more helpful when you prepare for what will happen in worship. Arrive early enough. 
kind of calm yourself as you enter the worship service of interruptions, which I know can be challenging with children in tow sometimes or other family members. I, I never really had the experience of getting children to church because of being back here. That was Donna's job. But the signal cannot come through when the path is all cluttered and cloudy. Growing up in, with my parents, we usually followed the same route from our house to the church. It's about 10 or 15 minutes to drive. And invariably, when we got to one certain insurance office building, one of my parents would look back at my brother Dale and say, Did you wash your glasses this morning? I, it was just a habit at that point, evidently. Sometimes he had, sometimes he didn't. I'll tell you about glasses the, he had that he soaked on another occasion. Anyway... There was this often mad dash for a tissue or a napkin to ensure, ensue and clean the dirty glasses. You see, a real threat was not going to that St. John's church with dirty glasses. Worship required that preparation to get the most out of it to get really connected with God, even your glasses had to be clean. For worship and prayer to really make a difference in your life also requires that these moments not be centered necessarily on the temperature of the worship space, are the light bulb that may be about to go out, or even if you're not fond of the preacher's bad southern accent. For worship to be effective, to make a difference, to be life-changing and value-shaking, requires that we focus, we center on Jesus. That's why we put a cross here at the center of our worship life together. Because it reminds us of what he has done for you and me. And how he challenges us to be better, more giving disciples and followers. Sometimes that's difficult for us to get our toes stepped on in worship. But there is a prophetic tradition, especially in the Old Testament, that talks about how we are to dust off our living when we come to this place. Worship, contrary to a lot of churches today, is not intended to be an entertainment experience, to be bigger and better. It's not to be about me or Ryan or Sarah or Timothy back there, even though we are here to facilitate your worship. It is to see Jesus and praise and honor him. One of the very best sermons I ever heard preached was by a Roman Catholic nun at the Poor Clares Monastery in Greenville. And some of the toughest and most difficult sermons, can we turn the camera off at this point, please, uh, to hear were from a United Methodist bishop or two. I've probably gone to meddling and I might get in trouble. It was quoted yesterday that Prince Philip really liked all types of worship, but he especially liked worship that was brief, he said.
said. Worship is to be this living hallelujah. It is to be first and foremost a time of praise, honor, and appreciation to our Heavenly Father. It is not solely a time of always getting our needs fulfilled. That's part of it. But that's not the greatest marker of worship. Because as I said, sometimes worship should challenge and push us to think and live in new and better and more Christ-like ways. And that leads you and me to the adjective that Adam Hamilton gives about worship. It is alive. It is a living action. It's something that we do with all of our life, not just when we're sitting in the pew. And it should make us think and hope and serve in better, more holy ways and make us more and more like Jesus. I think that's what happens when you and I really, really connect when we really get on God's wavelength. One of my favorite hymns expresses what the heart of worship is truly all about. I heard it first in chapel at Duke Divinity School. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. So shall our song of triumph ever be. Praise be to the crucified for victory. Lift high the cross. The love of Christ proclaim. Till all the world, all the world, adore his sacred name.
receive this benediction and call into this new week. Alleluia. Christ is risen. We are now raised with Christ to life eternal, to a life of worship and prayer, service and sharing, giving and loving. Let us go forth to live differently. Alleluia. Amen.